Okay. So um, thanks, James, for the nice introduction. So um, today um, I'm going to talk about um, quantum linear algebra. So um, uh, how to solve linear algebra problems on quantum computers. So this is a, a relatively new subject uh, for me. So I, I started looking to this about a year ago. So, um, so most of what I talk about here um, today uh, is sort of uh, my understanding of the state of art. Um, so instead of talking about um, um, what I've been working on uh, now, uh, I will sort of give you a overview of most other people's work. So before I actually get into the details, so let me just um, uh, talk about the objectives and the disclaimer for uh, this talk. So um, I want to talk about, um, basically I want to give a talk on the quantum algorithm for linear algebra uh, from the perspective of classical numerical linear algebra. Um, so, um, in that regard, I think um, the good thing is that I think a lot of people here are, are come from different backgrounds. So, um, so what I'm trying to do is that to talk about quantum computing uh, without requiring too much knowledge about uh, either quantum mechanics or uh, quantum computing. Um, and then I, the main message, so the talk is um, a little bit technical. As I was going through the slide uh, last night, I realized that um, it's, it's, there's a lot of stuff. Um, so um, if, you don't, if, you, if you get lost in the, in the sort of the technical detail, so the main message I want to convey is that um, this technique called block encoding. Uh, so I want to introduce that as a general framework uh, for solving uh, linear algebras on quantum computers. So, and I'll obviously be um, give you more uh, detail on that later. And another thing I want to I want to say is that um, you know quantum computing is is a fairly new thing, and it's um, it can be intimidating at the beginning. Um, but uh, really, um, you, one can actually make a lot of progress by. Um, combining what we already know, you know, things like approximation theory, optimization, uh, spectral uh, analysis, that sort of things that we do in classical numerical linear algebra. So we, we can actually uh, utilize a lot of things that we, we, we've done in the past to make progress in, in this area, which is very exciting. Um, and also as a disclaimer, I wanna say that um, most of what I talk about today it focuses on um, conceptual algorithm design um, rather than practical implementation. Uh, by practical, I mean uh, implementing that on the on the on the device. Okay, I, I will get to a circuit, uh, which you can view as some um, implementation of quantum algorithm. But I, I wouldn't go, and I've never actually run anything on a quantum device myself. So. Um, so I won't, there's a lot of issues uh, in, in terms of actually running these things. So, but I won't talk about any of that uh, today. And also another disclaimer is that there's actually a lot of work on um, quantum algorithms for solving linear system, uh, for, for solving linear algebra problems. So today uh, I'm only going to talk about one aspect of it. I mean, one particular class of algorithm. Uh, so I don't think there is time for me to sort of compare what I talk about today with um, other quantum algorithms for solving linear uh, algebra problem. Um, so my talk mostly, um, I, I took materials mostly from two papers. Um, so one is a, a paper by Charles Kothari and Soma um, that appeared in Science Journal in Computing in 2017, talk about quantum algorithm for solving system uh, linear equation. And the second one is by Gillian Su Lo Wee. It's a more recent paper on uh, quantum uh, signal, singular value transformation and beyond. Um, so to me, I mean, neither one of these paper is, is easy to read. Uh, so uh, the second paper is like 70 pages. There's a lot of stuff in there. So hopefully today I can, you know, unpack some of the uh, information. Um, they're very nice. I mean, they're very nice papers. It's just like, like, uh, but it's just like for me, uh, somebody who comes from a 
classical numerical linear algebra, it's a little bit uh, difficult to get into this. Um, uh, so hopefully um, I can make it easy for you uh, if you'd like to read these papers. So, so here's the plan for today. Um, so I will start talk about um, some basics uh, for quantum computing, okay, from um, a sort of a linear algebra perspective. And then I talk a little bit about um, sort of classical approaches to solve large scale linear algebra problems. Um, and then here I will basically point out the, the sort of the difference between quantum and classical and the why quantum is superior um, in some regard. Um, and then I will then introduce this block encoding idea. Um, so basically it's an idea uh, of embedding a non-unitary matrix into a larger uh, unitary matrix that you can um, manipulate on a quantum device and then be able to extract information out um, um, once you apply the unitary transformation. And I'll give uh, uh, two uh, examples of how to block encode um, um, some matrices. One, one type of matrix uh, is um, if a matrix can be written as a linear combination uh, of unitary matrix, then block encoding is relatively easy to do. Okay, LCU stands for linear combination of unitaries. And another type of um, um, matrix that you can easily um, block and code is um, basically the Markov chain. Um, so the random walk matrix or um, stochastic transition matrix. And that turns, you can block and code that to turn that into what's called quantum walks. Okay. Um, with linear LCU and quantum walk, block encoding, and then you can actually write, uh, uh, develop uh, block encoding for solving a linear system of equation. You can approximate in, a inverse uh, by a linear combination of Chebyshev polynomial, and then basically use LCU and quantum uh, walks to, uh, uh, to obtain approximate solution. Um, but that is actually turns out not to be the most efficient way to do it uh, in, terms of the, um, in terms of the circuit. Um, a better way uh, to do it is through this technique called singular value transformation or sometimes called quantum signal process. Okay. And then I also, in the end, if I have time, I also mention a little bit about, in addition to just solving classical linear algebra problem, uh, this sort of technique can also be applied to um, Hamiltonian simulation uh, where you have to basically approximate um, a matrix exponential. Okay, let's see. Um, so let's, uh, some basics. Um, so, um, so in quantum computing, we talk about qubits um, and, and quantum circuits. Uh, so uh, we know classical bits, if you have a register of a bunch of classical bits, um, that register basically contains a number, okay? It can be integer, it can be floating point, but it's a number, you know, if you have just three bits, you know, that, that gives you a number. But quantum bits uh, represent a tensor. So that's sort of ma a mathematician's way of looking at quantum computer. Um, so immediately you see that um, quantum bits, you know, if you have a quantum register with three bits, um, that gives you, um, you know, two to the three numbers. Um, so immediately you can see that uh, quantum bits gives you a lot more information than a classical bit, okay? Um, and that's one of the reasons why a quantum computer is so powerful. Um, it allows you to work with a, a much larger problem. Um, and a quantum algorithm uh, is essentially a, is essentially represented by a unitary matrix um, applied to a vector representation of a tensor. So psi here is a tensor, but you can think of it as a, um, a vector of two to the n with two to the n elements. Okay, we're talking about, um, uh, you know, representing that with n qubits. If, if psi here is represented by qubits, it's essentially a vector with two to the n elements. And u here is a two to the n by two to the n matrix. And it's a unitary matrix. Um, so a quantum algorithm basically applies, it's basically a, a matrix vector multiplication, okay? Um, but potentially with a very large matrix. Um, 
a quantum circuit is basically a decomposition of a unitary matrix into products of simple unitaries. Okay, so if you were to just construct that unitary matrix explicitly, uh, you obviously, um, you know, there's no gain um, uh, when you compare to cl classical computing, right? Um, so the, the reason that the quantum computing is efficient is that um, you can write U as a product of these U, uh, U1, U2, and UKs, and each one, each one of them is simpler, um, simpler in the sense that they can be written as chronicle products. I'll talk about what chronicle products are if you don't know what it is. Uh, for example, I have a circuit at the bottom here uh, with three lines, which means it's applied to a unitary applied to three qubits, which is you can think of it a vector of two to the three with two to the three, eight elements, right? And then um, you have a bunch of, the circuit has a bunch of layers with all these um, square blocks. Each one of them is, is sort of, a, 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 it's called a gate, but it's really a two by two matrix, okay? So the first layer you can see um, has only an H at the bottom um, qubit. So that, what that means is that it's, it's a unitary um, that can be written as identity chronic, identity chronic with H. So there's no gate on the first and second qubit. So that means nothing happens. So they're just identity, okay? Um, and then the U2 um, is a little bit, uh, different because you have this dot connected with this R4 and that's called a control rotation. So a control rotation can be written as E1 times identity times E2 plus E2 times R4, where E1, E2 are projectors. And I'll talk about uh, what these things are um, in the next slide. Okay, so just uh, before I, I, I talk, get into the detail, also some notations. So in, in, in quantum mechanics or quantum computer, uh, people uh, typically use what's called brat and cat, cat a notation. A cat is basically a column vector, a bra is basically a row vector, okay? And also convention is that when you write um, zero cat, uh, that just uh, says it's a, it's a standard canonical basis. Uh, in the case of a one qubit, it's just one zero, okay? And one is uh, is zero one, um, and the bra uh, zero is just the transpose of cat zero, and also chronicle products. Um, so this is how it's defined. Um, for most people, I think it's uh, it's um, uh, you know. Uh, then projectors. Uh, we will be using uh, projectors a lot later. Uh, a projector, uh, uh, typically here we talk about orthogonal projector is essentially a low rank matrix. So basically you can think of it, this as a psi i as a column vector times psi i transpose, where psi um, i is normalized to have norm one and all, uh, psi i, psi j, they're orthogonal to each other. Okay, so, and um, when you have um, a sort of a quantum state psi written as a linear combination of um, some, some bases, not necessarily um, elementary bases or sometimes called computational bases. Um, but if you write it as a linear combination of bases, what that means is that you can measure uh, when you throw a projector uh, in a particular basis onto this uh, quantum state, uh, you wind up with that quantum state with a probability uh, that is proportional to um, the square of the amplitude. Okay, so that, that's a little bit, that's also another thing that's somewhat different from um, classical computing. So, um, and then another thing that I think it won't probably won't come up later. I, I was originally thinking that maybe it's, uh, well, I'll get there, but maybe it's not. In, in, in quantum computing, uh, it's a lot of times we like to represent integers in, 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 uh, in binary form. Um, but but Chow, Chow yeah. can I get, uh, just a minor, perhaps yeah. a minor point, alpha, and beta, are they potentially complex numbers? Uh, they, they are potentially complex numbers. Yeah, that's so, another so, thing throughout the talk. Uh, mostly I will be talking about in the complex field, yeah. So that should be alpha star alpha mm -hmm. for alpha right, star. Right, absolutely. Yeah, I should put absolute alpha. Yeah, yeah. I should, absolute Thank alpha. you. Uh, so a particular gate that is uh, a two qubit gate that's um, that's used a lot in uh, quantum circuits is this uh, control U, which is um, written as a projector in the one a zero basis 
uh, plus a projector times u in the one basis. That what that means is that um, if you apply this operator to um, to the zero base one zero, then this part of the matrix gets activated. Uh, this is basically zero. Um, otherwise, um, you get to apply u to the second qubit. Okay, and typically there's a um, uh, one particular case of U is this uh, X gate, which is basically switch swaps the uh, qubit from the zero state to one state. Okay, so these are the basics. So now um, let me talk about, uh, let's have to watch time. Oh, already 15 minutes. Okay, so, um, so in classical lin numerical linear algebra, so the typical problem we solve are linear systems, least squares and eigenvalue problems. Now for large problems, we, we typically use iterative method, right? especially when A is sparse or A times a V uh, uh, can be um, performed efficiently. So um, in the end, essentially what we do in iterative method is we, for example, try to approximate A inverse by a polynomial of A, where the polynomial um, approximates one over X, okay? So that's that's what we do essentially, okay. And least square is a similar sort of similar thing. Um, you 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 can think of it as uh, computing the um, um, the pseudo inverse, um, and which boils down to approximating the inverse of a transpose a. Uh, eigenvalue problems. Um, you basically also, if you use a Lanchos method, for example, you basically your eigenvector approximation is basically a polynomial in a times some initial. Uh, guess where the polynomial amplifies um, the eigenvalue that you're interested in. So sort of like a, some kind of band pass polynomial. You can think of it that way. Um, so so there's um, so let me talk about complexity, right? We all care about how efficient the computation is. So in, in, in the classical case, what we care about is uh, usually flock count, right? Um, and also sometimes we worry about data movement, both in memory and among nodes or processors. Uh, we talk about the volume of data movement and how frequent we move the data, which is related to latency. And our goal is often to try to reduce, uh, for example, um, uh, n to the third complexity to n square or ideally to order n which is sort of like, the, you know, we consider that to be very efficient. For example, multiplying diagonal matrix with a vector, and that only costs the order n operation, and we consider that to be very efficient. But on a quantum computer, even that is considered not uh, necessarily efficient. So on a quantum computer, we typically talk about query complexity and the gate complexity. So what is query complexity? Query complexity refers to, um, so if you have a quantum circuit, which represents a unitary matrix, uh, in a quantum, com a, a quantum algorithm, you may have to uh, um, access U multiple times, okay? So uh, maybe, you know, in like a Grover search algorithm, you have to, uh, you have to uh, access this multiple times. So the query complexity is basically refers to how many times you have to access certain unitary. Okay? And then the gate complexity uh, refers to basically how many elementary gates do you have in a quantum circuit representation of a unitary. Um, the reason why um, in the quantum computing we, we only care about gate complexity instead of the, the flock count is that um, this took me a, a little while to realize. Um, <clears throat> maybe it's it's kind of obvious, maybe to, to people in physics, but um, the reason is that uh, when we think about applying a unitary to a um, a, a quantum state or tensor, um, it's um, it's maybe better to think of um, think of the tensor as as being decomposed as a linear combination of chronicle products of um, smaller bases, okay, two by two base, uh, two, uh, two one bases, right? So when you apply a elementary gate like U1, which is um, identity chronic with identity chronic H, and you see that the, the, the H gate, which is what's called a Hadamard gate, um, a two by two Hadamard gate, 
only applies to one of the bases. And since k is either zero or one, so the, the cost of applying this gate is more or less constant, okay? And of course, you have to ultimately take a linear combination of all of these. Um, in a classical computing, you would actually take a linear, have to take a linear combination of that uh, to get your answer. But in a quantum computing, you don't have to do that. I mean, so the beauty about quantum computing is that you can leave it as a superposition of basis states. So, um, so in quantum computing, we don't actually take into account of the, the cost of what to, to do in this linear combination. So that's why uh, in terms of complexity, all you care really is about uh, applying these gates, elementary gates to um, computational bases or some other bases, but they're, they're small bases. So that's why um, uh, complexity is evaluated in gates. And our goal is essentially to turn an algorithm um, into a complexity that is proportional to a polynomial in log of n, okay? So because n is what n is two to the n. Okay, so so two to the a so a so here is there are three qubits. So if we can devise a algorithm or do a decomposition so that the number of gates is proportional to uh, three, and that's considered a uh, three a power of three, low power of three, that's considered efficient. Okay, so how do we do that uh, for linear algebra problems? So the general strategy that uh, we use is to um, to try to obtain a polynomial in A times a uh, starting uh, some initial state, um, try to use some unitary transformation. So what we do is we block in code P of A, which is a matrix into a bigger un uh, matrix that is unitary. So you can think of it as, as mentally as, as like putting a P of A at the upper, lower, uh, upper left corner of a matrix U. Um, so, and uh, we don't necessarily really care about uh, what these things are as long as U is unitary, okay? Um, if we can do that, uh, and if we also prepare the initial state um, to, to make it the chronicle product of zero state with the, um, the state that you would like to apply your matrix on, um, this is basically means the chronicle products of the zero. So it's one zero with uh, psi that gives you psi zero. Then uh, when you apply that, you can see that uh, what you get by applying this unitary is that you get uh, PA times psi in the first component of this vector. And then if you measure that, um, or you can write it this way, um, then if you measure this first, uh, what we call register, um, and if you measure it to be zero, then the second register uh, contains essentially what you want. Now, this is also something a little bit different from uh, uh, classic computing. So you measure that, uh, then you get this state in your second register. Um, you don't necessarily have a, a direct, you don't necessarily can read it out um, as you would do in a classic computer, but you can make use of it to, to, uh, to do subsequent calculation. Okay, so how do we do that? How, how yes. Could I just go back <clears throat> one slide? And I want to make sure um, I'm following you here. Now, A uh, could be a Hamiltonian, I guess, right? Yeah, it could be a Hamiltonian, yes. And A, uh, A for typical problems we deal with is self-adjoint, right? Right. So uh, when, you, when you write P of A, that's some polynomial in this self-adjoint Hamiltonian, is that what you're talking about? I mean, that would be the case that I'm thinking of. Yes. Okay. Yes. And the asterisk here represents what? Uh, there's some other matrices that I don't, uh, at this point, I don't want to bother to write them down. But then on the next slide, you see what they can oh, okay. look like. Okay. 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 Um, so, yeah, so uh, that's a good question. And I'll give you an example. Uh, uh, of how these may, uh, can look like. It's not the way we compute it, but uh, as an example of block encoding of A, uh, you can see that um, if I put A here on the uh, upper left corner and I put I minus A squared, uh, square root of that, uh, minus you know that, um, and that gives me a unitary matrix, you can verify. So um, I, I, 
we gotta have to make some assumptions about A being real or uh, in, in general, you can be complex and then you have to turn some of these uh, conjugate on somewhere. Um, so, um, so this matrix is, is unitary, um, but uh, the block encoding A is not unique, uh, okay? So you can sort of see that uh, you can, uh, if this is U, um, you can apply, you know, any transformations like that with any U2, you can, you can still get a, a, another block encoding. Um, now, this is not a practical way to do it because in order to construct this um, block encoding, I have to compute a square root of a i minus a square, which is, you know, um, uh, we don't know, I mean, how to do that. Even, you know, do, working with a is already hard enough and working with a square and, and square root, that's, that's obviously hard. So that's not a practical way to, to block encode. Um, <clears throat> and then, once you do that, you have to also be able to decompose that as an efficient quantum circuit. You have to decompose that as a product of simpler unitary. So that's another thing that we have to worry about. Okay, so now let me give you an example of um, one class of matrices that you can possibly efficiently in, uh, block encode, which is a matrix that can be written as a linear combination of some unitaries that you already have. Okay. Um, so, um, and you can, you can see that A, you can write just maybe, you know, it's hard to go through this uh, algebra uh, on the fly, but you believe me that you can actually go uh, write A as in this particular form, okay? And then um, it's possible to construct a unitary to turn one zero into um, square root of alpha one, which is this coefficient square root of alpha two divided by the one norm of, of that vector uh, the, the reason you have to normalize is that this is a unitary, so it has to turn a, a vector of norm one to a vector norm one. So, um, so you can possibly find uh, a unitary uh, through rotations or something to get that. And then you basically can write your uh, block encoding as u equals uh, V transpose uh, chronicle with identity times this block diagonal unitary um, and uh, V uh, chronic with I. So um, you can sort of verify, um, uh, I'm not asking you to do it right now, but you can sort of verify it if you apply this U uh, to this vector, um, then you'll get uh, E1 chronic with A psi plus some, uh, you know, orthogonal components if you have something. Uh, and then if you measure um, the first register, if it measures to come out to be E1, here I, I switch the notation. So E1 is basically the zero uh, cap, okay? And then you get um, A psi in the second reg register with the probability of that norm of that A psi, okay? Um, so to do that, um, you just need an, uh, one extra ancillary qubit. Uh, so that's not a qubit that you use to encode the original psi state, okay? And in general, you would need uh, log m uh, and silo qubits, uh, where m is the number of terms in this uh, linear combination. So that's um, one way to um, to block encode uh, one one class of matrix matrices uh, that you can easily block encode. Uh, now you can also in extend this to um, linear combinations of non-unitary. So if you have a linear combination of some matrices that are simple, but they're not necessarily unitary, then you can, you can do it, but it's, uh, you have to work a little bit harder. So what you have to do is you have to first block encode um, the non-unitary matrix into a unitary matrix, UI, right? That will allow you to uh, write down uh, a matrix, which is a linear combination of unitaries. And then you can use the previous techniques to block encode um, this, um, this matrix. So that means that you will need uh, extra qubits uh, to, to do this, right? You're, you're creating a, a bigger matrix. So that means you need extra uh, qubits to accommodate that. Uh, so you need the extra qubits to, well, you need qubits to, extra qubits to encode this coefficient. And then you also need an extra, extra qubit to encode uh, each one of these um, AIs, but it's possible. Um, 
So another type of matrix that you can uh, somewhat easy to encode is these Markov chain matrix. So it's, this is a, sometimes called stochastic matrix or transition probability matrix P. Um, it's a matrix with um, um, basically you can think of a probability uh, representing the transition probability going from uh, I to J uh, on a graph. Okay, if you think of a graph and then the um, the matrix elements of, of P are basically sort of uh, the transition probability of going from one vertex to another. Okay, so there's a lot of literatures about, um, you know, class, so this, this, uh, this is related to what's called classical random walk. So if you apply this uh, transition probability uh, matrix to a some kind of a distribution probab probability distribution of some um, state, and then you apply it repeatedly, uh, you get the uh, probability of being at certain vertex after taking n steps of a random walk. Okay. So won't get into that too much. So how do we uh, block and code that? So this is through a technique called Segeti Quan walk. Uh, so uh, it's a little bit technical. Um, so let's see if I can uh, try to explain this well. So you have a P, uh, which is N, N by N matrix. Okay, so we're going to create um, a matrix much larger than that. It's going to be actually um, uh, N square by N square. Okay, so what we do is we take a particular, we take a, a column of P and chronic product it with um, a elementary basis. J, okay, the Jth, uh, yeah, so this is the Jth column of P, chronic product with the uh, elementary base, the Jth column of identity, essentially, okay? Um, that gives us a vector because of the chronic product, uh, you go from N to N square, right? So then you can define a orthogonal projector, taking this I, Psi I, Si J, uh, you can uh, define a rank N projector uh, in a n square by n square space, right? And then with that projector, you can define a refle reflector, uh, which is two times pi minus i. Um, and then you define what's called a swap operator. Um, since you now have two registers, uh, one for this elementary basis and one for the column of the p, uh, then you can swap them, uh, swap the um, the elements of these um, two registers, uh, that's, um, and then you, that's basically defines a swap operator. Now there is, um, uh, so I will use this notation, I comma J is basically a chronic product, I shorthand notation for chronic product I and J. And you can verify that, um, um, if psi, um, is the matrix representation of, I, I guess, yeah, sorry, I, I sort of used different notation, um, of this, this columns of um, P, then uh, you can verify that a psi, inner product of psi with respect to the swap operator is basically P. So that's sort of a detail, but the important thing is that, so we define a quantum walk operator. A uh, quantum op walk operator is basically the product, the swap operator times the reflector. And the reflector contains the original um, stochastic matrix information. And then you can verify that this is indeed a unitary matrix. Now, the interesting thing about the, the quantum walk operator is that um, assuming if that um, we're, the, the eigenvalues of P are between zero and one or minus one or one uh, with the corresponding eigenvector represent by this cat lambda, uh, just a notation. And then you can show that um, this um, psi times lambda and S times psi times lambda times lambda, so this, this is a vector, so this is a matrix times a vector, uh, is another vector, so this is also a matrix times a matrix times a vector, it's another vector. So this is a vector, uh, a space of two dimensions, so this is, turns out to be invariant under W. Okay? So you can do, go through the a verification to show that um, indeed, 
So this, this space is invariant subspace under W. And then if you perform a QR factorization of the spaces um, using, for example, Gram-Schmidt, uh, you show that this W uh, can, be, can, can be represented by this two by two matrix in this basis. Okay. So, um, so this is a key thing. So now instead of working with um, you know, W, uh, if effectively, we just need to work with a two by two matrix like that. Okay, so lambda here, the reason that lambda is sort of eigenvalue of P. So if you block encode, uh, if you, W has this representation, right, under some basis, that just means that W uh, has P in the one, one block. Okay, so, so that just shows that uh, W is actually a block, block encodes P in its upper left corner. Um, and not only that, you can actually show that powers of W um, actually has this particular representation also. That means not only the P can be easily in block encoded, but also um, polynomial, even if polynomial of P can be block encoded, okay? So, um, so here is, uh, T is the uh, Chebyshev polynomial of the first kind and U is of the second kind. So that doesn't really matter, but what's important is that you can actually now block encode uh, W to the kth power uh, in this formalism. So um, now, of course, the matrices that wor we work with are not always um, um, Markov chain matrix, transition matrix, right? So for arbitrary matrix, sparse matrix, how do we, uh, not a random walk, how do we actually block encode that? Um, now, there's a, actually a clever trick um, that Childs uh, and coworkers develop. Uh, so basically you can actually create from N by N matrix, you can create a matrix that is two N by N. So you put the original matrix or its con uh, complex conjugate on the upper left, uh, on, the, on the top part of this matrix. And then for the bottom mark, uh, part of the matrix for each one, uh, each non-zero element in this um, top part, you just create another uh, non-zero element, which is one minus AIJ. Okay? So that goes in the top, that goes in the bottom. And then uh, you go through the same formalism. You construct, you take the columns of these matrices, uh, augment them with elementary bases to create a projector, uh, create a reflector. You have a swap operator, and then you can write down a random walk. Okay, and it turns out that um, after you enlarge this so that each column uh, represents some kind of transition probability that sum, sums up to one. Um, you can actually show that the quantum walk uh, that you construct out of this augmented matrix uh, can be represented by this, um, this two by two matrix, um, which is very nice. That just means that we can now also block in code A in its upper, le uh, upper left corner. Okay, so now to put everything together, um, so what, what, do we, what do we do here? So our objective is to solve AX equals B. So we do that by approximating, um, by approximating one over X by a polynomial, for example, right? So um, for example, we have a problem that is indefinite. We try to approximate that on this interval. Um, and that's Delta here, a one over Delta basically represents the condition number. So we represent that by a linear combination of Chebyshev polynomial, okay? So that's M is the degree of the polynomial. So we know that um, the Chebyshev polynomial in A, so we're going to, um, when, we, when we do the matrix computation, we replace X by the matrix, right? So that's, that's clear, hopefully clear here. So what we do is <clears throat> we can use um, the techniques that I talked about a few slides ago to block and code a Chebyshev polynomial in A by a quantum walk, okay? Chebyshev polynomial of any degree by quantum walk to the any power, okay? And then 
since this is a now becomes that uh, this becomes a linear combination of unitaries, right? So all the Chebyshev polynomial will be replaced by W to the K and W is a unitary, W to the K is also unitary. So now we're in a regime that we have a linear combination of unitary and we know how to block and code that. So, and that's sort of the, the unitary that, uh, how the unitary will look, okay? So to do that, what we need is that we need, um, if the, the matrix is size N, then we need uh, log N to, um, to encode the original matrix. We need uh, another log N, remember we make the matrix 2N by 2N. Oh, we need, yeah, so we need two times log N to encode the quantum walk. Um, <clears throat> then we need a log M uh, qubits to encode these coefficients. So um, <clears throat> now the query complexity depends on how often we have to uh, access this W, right? So then that's determined by the degree of the polynomial, okay? And then you can go through an analysis to show that um, it depends on the condition number, it depends on the uh, error tolerance. And the gate complexity, that depends on the sparsity structure and the numerical values of A, okay? So, uh, and ultimately the circuit will look like that, but I think I'm gonna actually, originally I was going to talk a little bit about the circuit. Um, uh, in particular, I wanna give an example of how to um, actually construct a circuit for a quantum walk, but I think in the interest of time, uh, I'm gonna actually skip that um, um, and talk about uh, the last thing I wanna talk about, which is, um, um, Cubitization. Uh, so, is it correct? I have only fifteen minutes left. Yeah, that, that's fine, uh, John. Okay. Okay. So, uh, in, it turns out that so what we talked about is a spectral decomposition quantum walk operator gives you essentially a two-dimensional subspace represented by this. Okay. Uh, so you can also write this as um, exponential of some uh, some matrix, two by two matrix. Yeah, this is refers to cubitization. That means that instead of looking at the entire matrix, you only need to look at the two by two dimensional subspace. You can in turn, it turns out that you can generalize that uh, for any unitary matrix, any reflector. Um, you can actually show that um, the, these two matrices can be simultaneously diagonalized or not diagonalized. There's a, yeah, simultaneously uh, diagonalized and there's an invariant uh, two dimensional invariant subspace under which the reflector um, will look like, uh, well, actually this should be R. The reflector will have a representation of one minus one and the unitary will have a representation in this form that it looks like the one that we had before. And uh, also what's uh, interesting is that um, it turns out that you can actually block and code any polynomial of A um, by this decomposition in which you basically intersperse um, a exponential of a face angle times the reflector uh, with a block encoding of the matrix A. So you have, if you have a block encoding of A, uh, then you can actually find a bunch of face angles to construct um, a, a, a product of this form uh, that can just, uh, that can encode um, uh, polynomial A. And then in terms of the circuit, uh, that means that instead of coding the, um, linear combination of unitaries, you have to use extra qubit to encode these coefficients. You just need an extra qubit to encode these phase angles, okay? So the circuit, if you have a block encoding of A, um, so that's the extra qubit that you need to encode A, block encode A, then you can, it turns out that you only need one extra qubit to encode a polynomial of A, okay? So this is called a singular value transformation. Uh, you can actually do this, um, um, not just a polynomial, but you can actually uh, do a singular value decomposition analysis on that, but I won't go through. So, <clears throat> um, so I won't talk about this uh, in detail. So the key is that, you know, how do we actually find these, um, 
the, these phase angles, okay? Uh, it turns out that to find the phase angle, you, um, you actually have to uh, find the roots of some polynomial, uh, which is very difficult. Um, if the polynomial has very large degree, uh, you have to use extended precision in Mathematica or Julia. Um, another way to do is, is to, you can actually formulate this problem as an optimization problem, okay? So you basically want to um, treat this uh, block encoding matrix U as a function of these phase angles. And then you basically only look, need to look at uh, this function uh, in, in, in lambda and try to make sure that uh, uh, the difference between these two is small, uh, is minimized with respect to the phase angle. Okay. And it turns out that this is actually, you can, you can use, um, the reason that the optimization worked is that you generally have a reasonably good starting guess. So this is the recent work by uh, my colleague in uh, Leiling at UC Berkeley, uh, who, who's done some really nice work. Okay, so the last uh, thing that I want to talk about, uh, so how do we actually use this sort of techniques to do Hamiltonian simulation? So in Hamiltonian simulation, basically what we do is we need to uh, basically evolve this matrix exponential. So the standard technique is that you split H into like simpler Hamiltonians by through this trotter, trotterization scheme. Uh, and then you try, to, um, you try to evolve these things um, efficiently. Um, the way we do here is we try to approximate E to the I X T by a polynomial, okay? So you can, um, it turns out you can actually write down a polynomial. I, forget. Uh, I have a typo. This is supposed to be JK, supposed to be special function. Uh, evaluate at, at some certain time. So th these are just scalars, okay? And T here is the Chebyshev polynomial of the first kind. Um, and there's even terms and odd terms, but basically this is a, a polynomial. So that means that we're basically um, can block encode this polynomial in Hamiltonian, right? Um, uh, we can write down block encoding and the advantage is it doesn't require trotter splitting, um, which introduces error but it, you, we do need to actually construct uh, a block encoding for the polynomial approximation. There's, so there's um, approx two approximation here. One is the polynomial approximation and the other approximation is these face angles contained in phi uh, that have to be computed numerical. Okay, so now let me uh, conclude. Um, so I know, I apologize, there's a lot of technical detail, but I think the, the, one of the message I want to convey is that block encoding is, is a powerful um, technique to embed non-unitary matrix into a larger unitary matrix. And I gave some examples how to block encode uh, linear combination of unitaries in quantum blocks. Um, for general sparse matrix, um, block encoding is not trivial. Um, um, partly because, um, so in, in the literature, uh, a lot of people just wave their hands. Uh, they, uh, when they don't know exactly how to do that, they say, you know, we have an oracle uh, that allows us to efficiently uh, block and code. Uh, especially you have to figure out, uh, the difficulty is that you have, for sparse matrix, you have to somehow encode the non-zero position of the non-zero non elements as well as the numerical value of these non-zero elements. And, and you have to do it, in, do it in a way so that you don't have to access each individual column separately. Because that already, if you have to in, access, uh, process in, in, each individual column, that's already ordered n, which in quantum computing is considered inefficient, right? So we want to get to log of n. Um, so once the block encoding of A is available, we only need one extra a qubit to block encode any matrix function. Uh, well, if it's not any matrix, I mean, nice matrix that can be approximated by polynomial, right? And then the complexity of that is essentially the query complexity, the number of times you have to access the block encode uh, circuit times the, the number of gates in the circuit. And it depends on uh, the condition number of A, it depends on your error tolerance, and also depends on the, uh, uh, the structure of the matrix. Okay, uh, I think that's it. Thanks. Well, thank you, uh, thank you, Chow. Um, and um, you have left some time for, for questions, um, and we'd like to open it up uh, for questions, but I'd like to take advantage of having the uh, microphone to ask you 
the first question, if you like. Mm -hmm. If you could go back uh, two or three slides uh, where you, yeah, no, uh, forward now, uh, forward again. Again, somehow, when you got to the point of the Hamiltonian problem, you were you were near the end of the talk. Oh, so the Hamiltonian simulation. Yeah, when you were in the Hamiltonian simula simulation part. Yeah. Right. Okay. Good. Let's just stop right there. Yeah. A couple questions, yeah. um, and that involves comparing this approach to say Trotterization. Right. Um, now. Uh, I see the factorized form is written. That seems advantageous. But uh, what about comparing that with trotterization? I mean, ultimately, we want to do the do a problem as a function of t. Right. T is a parameter, and you want to start the problem at some t naught and advance it up to some finite value of t. Right. Yeah. Um, and I'm familiar with doing it with the trotterization method. What what does this offer over trotterization in terms of number of trips through the quantum computer you have to take? Let's say is this a one pass through? Somehow? Yeah, it, well, it's so depending on what you mean by one pass. Um, so yeah, trotterization. You basically you you have to split h, right? So yeah. you you split h. Um, in a very short time period. So you have to, because it's H is if you split, if it's not commu non commuting, then um, when you split, it introduces error, right? right? To keep that error small, each time you actually have to take a sequence of time steps, right? Each one of them is, is tiny, uh, has to be tiny. Um, you, you can do some error estimates, and there's you know, product splitting of different orders. Um, higher orders allow you to, to uh, take a larger time step, but uh, but there is an issue, so the complexity will be uh, ultimately determined by um, how many, how, how do you splice your time, right? right. If you, uh, and, and the further you go, uh, the less efficient it becomes because then you have to take, you know, a lots and lots of time step. And that's not a problem here because this is a one-shot thing that whatever T is, um, I just construct a approximation. Okay, um, now um, there's a caveat here. Um, so obviously the approximation to this exponential function uh, depends, so depends on, depends on the, um, the spectrum of H, right? Uh, the larger the spectrum, the, the higher the polynomial you, you need to uh, choose. And also obviously also depends on T, the, high, the larger the T, um, um, possible. I haven't done the analysis because this is actually the comp. It's a complex expo exponent, right? So it's not entirely clear. So it's possible that for larger t, you need a higher degree polynomial, mm -hmm. right? Okay. So um, and what that translates into, uh, if you have a higher degree polynomial, that just means that you possibly need more face angles here. Uh, in this block encoding. So block encoding, assuming you can you can block encode um, H somehow, uh, uh, which obviously, uh, well, uh, I don't know if it's obvious. Um, so for simple Hamiltonians like uh, uh, a spin, uh, you know, spin models that you can, because you can write it as a linear combination of chronicle products of poly matrices with identities. And since polys are more or less unitary, you know, um, and you can write this, H is basically linear combination unitaries. And so you can, uh, you can block and effectively block and code the H. Um, but if you have something uh, like, a, a, you know, many body, true many body Hamiltonian uh, for nuclear or electrons, then you have uh, to choose uh, some onsets. You basically have to, uh, in the second quantization, you have to map the creation annihilation operators to, you know, poly operators somehow through this, uh, mm -hmm. uh, some formalism, right? Uh, so then ultimately you have to basically, the higher degree, the more of these phase angles you have to construct. So uh, I don't know exactly how to compare the complexity um, at the moment, but I think one can um, 
argue that uh, maybe uh, one is in some cases more efficient than the other. Yeah, and, and that deserves further discussion, but not now. Um, I think um, there, there would be, hopefully uh, we can take an opportunity to schedule something with you to pursue some of these lines of discussion. Sure. But let's not take all the time today for that. Uh, let's open it up to uh, anybody else who would like to ask a question. And there's relatively few of us. So just simply uh, unmute your microphone and ask if you have a question. Uh, Professor Yang, I had a question. Yes. So um, I was wondering about the, um, the walk operator and what exactly Lambda is and if you need to actually calculate it prior. Okay. No, you don't. So the short answer is you don't have to uh, calculate the uh, Lambda. Um, this is all sort of a, a analysis. Um, so the, the lambda, so in the walk operator, a lambda is essentially, you can think of it as eigenvalue of the, um, of the, of P. Okay. Um, but we don't actually, um, we don't actually compute that. Um, so it's eigenvalue of P. So, so typically what we, we think of it is that if we know the, all the eigenvalues, of, um, then we know the matrix, right? So it's through the spectral decomposition theory. If you know all the eigenvalues and eigenvectors, you know the matrix. And also, um, if you can um, analyze the eigenvalues and eigenvectors, essentially, effectively, you analyze the matrix. So it's, it's sort of a mental exercise um, is that you go through to say that if you can put the eigenvalue um, of P in this uh, upper left corner of this two by two matrix, then effectively, you, you put matrix P in the upper left corner of um, this N square by N square matrix. Th does that uh, answer your question? Um, the eigenvalue is used a as a way to, to analyze this technique, but it's not uh, um, how, we, how we do it. Okay, great, thanks. Yeah, that's answered. Thanks a lot. I have another question while we're waiting for others to come up with a question. If you, if you uh, again, go to the end of the talk and then you say, all right, I have a method of um, solving for, looks like I could in principle get the eigen spectrum out of a Hamiltonian uh, at the end of the uh, procedures that you outlined. Yeah, after you, at the end of this, do you end up with all the eigenvalues of, of the original Hamiltonian in principle? Oh, no, no, no. That's, uh, well, this is just the propagate, right? So you, you, you do Hamiltonian simulation, you approximate that, you apply this actually to some initial state. Um, you, you get, so, but this is not a, a method for computing eigenvalue. Um, to compute eigenvalue, uh, I actually would uh, think of this way. Uh, yeah, so um, <clears throat> um, so you would um, actually try to, um, um, let's see, uh, maybe this is not a very good picture, so I'll go back to the very beginning. Um, so for example, if you um, want to compute the eigenvalue, near zero, okay? So you can think that you may be able to construct a polynomial um, maybe ahead of time or maybe through, through some other mechanism. And then you basically can approximate um, P of A with this block encoding. Okay, you can embed P and A in the upper left corner of a unitary matrix. Okay, so if you want to do ground state, uh, a polynomial that you would construct would probably look like this. So, and this, this is sort of like also another common theme in uh, quantum computing is that a lot of these quantum algorithms use this technique called amplitude amplification, right? So basically the idea here is that you construct the a polynomial to amplify um, the eigenvector uh, that you're interested in. So if you, you're interested in low ground, uh, ground state or low excitation state, you would uh, construct a polynomial like, that look like this. 
Um, if you want some eigenvalue in the middle, uh, you will try to construct a polynomial like that. And then block encode the, the matrix polynomial as a unitary. That answer, I, yeah. I, I do have a question. Yeah. Um, so if you want actually has a quantum computer, which, which method do you think would be the best for actually implementing the solution of AX equals B? Um, well, that's a, that's a very, um, so are you talking about at, at a practical level or uh, the conceptual level? Because it's, uh, it's to implement uh, something like this on a quantum computer, on a quantum device, uh, actually, it's, um, there's a lot of questions to be answered. Oh, okay, okay. So if you actually wanted to implement something on a quantum device, what are your thoughts about methods? Yeah, you can you can do this block encoding. I mean, I have my colleague, uh, Ling Ling at Berkeley, they're actually running things on quantum device uh, using block encoding. Uh, um, but they do this on, uh, they do this for random matrices. Matrices. They actually created what's called quantum uh, link pack ben benchmark. Mm -hmm. uh, but because the, see the trouble is that even getting elements of A onto a quantum computer uh, that's already a, a a thing that I don't know how to do. Oh. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. So I mean you can talk about um, these uh, simple uh, you know you can talk about poly matrices and stuff like that. Uh, but if you give me an arbitrary matrix. You know, it's it's uh it's not an easy task to even uh, uh, put the matrix on a quantum computer mm -hmm. um, at the moment, uh, at least at the moment. Right. right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank Chow, you. Uh, sorry, Chow, Chow. We have some questions that are in the chat window. Okay. Can you can you uh, open up your chat window and uh, take a look at those? And um, there's um, additional questions, starting with Wei Ji Du's question. Oh, sure. Can you see the chat window? Uh, I think I have to stop sharing before I can. Yeah, okay. Um, and you go down to the lower uh, bar, there's a chat, chat yeah. icon to click on, which will show you the chat questions. At what speed up can we expect from these procedures on a fault tolerant? Mm -hmm. um, quantum computer. Um, um, I think that's, again, that's a question. So uh, I'm not sure what you mean by fault tolerant um, because the, it's, I think, um, are you talking about um, a, a quantum computer with uh, some effective error correcting? Because um, right now the quantum computers are, they're not, um, you know, very reliable, right? So these, there's lots of errors. Qubits have errors and gates have errors. Um, uh, so possibly in that regime, uh, you, you have to do this um, not only once, you have to do uh, these calculations multiple times. Um, so that's another question I don't know how to answer. Uh, mm -hmm. <clears throat> in principle, um, the, the uh, I mean, the overarching theme is that on a quantum computer, you can effectively uh, do this uh, for n by n linear system. Uh, you can you can solve it with uh, poly log n. You can you can solve it with a complexity that is log n to the, some low degree polynomial. Okay, um, but um, that's still assuming that you have a perfect quantum computer uh, to some extent. Okay, if if you don't have a quantum computer, you have to do error correction and you have to do lots of other things. Uh, I, I don't actually know at this moment uh, what, what that means. Um, Could you scroll up on the uh, chat window to the top of the chat questions? Because there's one by uh, Weiji Du. Okay, yeah. What if uh, H is uh, time dependent, right? Um, okay, so you're talking about in the in the context of Hamiltonian simulation. Right, well, or scattering problems is what he's probably thinking about where, you know, a, a projectile is moving through an external field, which is changing in time. Yeah, so I, I, I don't know. I think the, yeah, so if you have a, um, 
the time-dependent Hamiltonian, the matrix exponential, the propagator is uh, more complicated, right? So you, um, I don't know, it's usually the way you do that is you have to do some uh, expansion. Um, um, mm -hmm. uh, I, I have to think about how to um, do that in this particular context. Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know. Okay, we can, we can um, perhaps chat yeah. some more with you at a, again at a later time about that yeah. possibility. So now more more questions appeared at the bottom of the chat. So if you scroll down, yeah, I see. Yeah, with defective error correction. Yeah. So yeah, okay, I just an answer. To your, fault tolerance. Yeah. Yeah, an answer to your question, Joe. Um, I should mention. Uh, uh, that we have recorded this, if it's okay with you, Chow, we will uh, post this along with our other seminars so people can come back and uh, go through it again. Um, sure. Also, we'd appreciate getting your slides uh, in, in case uh, we could actually just look, toggle through the slides directly without the sure. yes. yeah. uh, video. Yeah. That would be great. A lot of stuff. It's, it's very heavy. I I, I just I realized last last night that as I was going making mm -hmm. some slides, you know, it's I, I, good supremacy. Um, I I I don't know. I mean, so the quantum advantage is clear. Uh, at least in my um, my view is that uh, basically you get exponential speed up. So that's it. That's it. That's the that's end it. of story. Yeah. Okay. To me, that's the advantage. The goal okay. is you get exponential speed up. So what you what you outlined are quantum advantage criteria, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I, I guess then by extension, the quantum supremacy is to take a real problem and do it at orders of magnitude, actually do it orders of magnitude facts faster on an actual quantum computer uh, compared to an actual classical computer at the same point in time. Right. I think I think that's what people generally think of with quantum supremacy. Okay, good. Any other uh, questions for Chow right now? There's a new one there. And the chat, last one. Uh, you can do uh, imaginary time evolution. Uh, yes, I think so. The answer is, I think yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Great. Well, uh, Chow, I want to thank you on behalf of all of us for a wonderful, stimulating presentation. And we very much, I very much appreciate, I think others do too, your yes. attempt to be pedagogical at the outset to get us uh, up to speed on some of the uh, most elementary aspects of this, which are sometimes quite baffling. Um, I think uh, there'll be an interest in doing some follow-up, maybe small group discussions with you, uh, which we'll try to schedule by email with you uh, sure. over the coming weeks. So yeah, happy to yeah. do that. Great, great, great. Well, thank you very much, everybody.